I'm Betty, 32 years old, living in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm an extrovert who likes to party. Every weekend, I will go to a bar to relieve stress after a week of work. Gradually, I cannot do without cocktails, music, lights, and dances. They make me feel extremely relaxed. And every day I came home later and later, there were times when I didn't leave the bar until dawn. But I just went there to have fun, absolutely nothing else. I live alone in an apartment in the Edge in downtown area. I am free to do what I want and I have no intention of getting married. Everything went normal until one day. That was Saturday. I arrived to my apartment lobby around 12 o'clock. My hair was messy. I held high heels in one hand and a handbag in the other, walking unsteadily. I stepped into the elevator and pressed the button to the 15th floor. I could feel the strong smell of my alcohol throughout the elevator. Just as the elevator door was about to close, a hand came to stop it. Entering was a tall man, dressed in black and wearing a full face mask. I was half sober, half drunk, so I didn't pay too much attention to him. He reached across my face and pressed the button for floor number 14. The smell of perfume on him was quite impressive. Silence reigned for a few seconds. The elevator displayed floor number 14. The man stepped out. He turned around and looked straight at me, and at the same time took out a small knife. He spoke in a very low voice. See you on the 15th floor, sister. Then, a terrifying <laughs> laugh echoed. It took me a few seconds to realize I was in danger. I quickly dialed the elevator's floor number. I want to call the police, but I can't remember the phone number. Without any preparations, the elevator reached the 15th floor and opened the door. My body stiffened. I knew I was about to encounter something terrible, but I couldn't resist anymore. A few seconds later, everything went quiet. I slowly walked out of the elevator, looked around and saw no one. I quickly ran back to my apartment and locked my door. If it were anyone else, I think they would call the police or building security, but I don't. Part of me is controlled by alcohol. I threw my things onto the floor and ran into the bedroom. I slept and forgot about the danger that was still lurking. The next morning, I woke up and looked at the clock. It was already past 10 a.m. My head hurts, my whole body aches, and the memory of last night is like a broken tape. When I sat up, trying to regain consciousness, I was startled to see a sharp knife placed on the pillow next to me. Holding up the knife for inspection, my heart felt like it was tightening as I read the name engraved onto the blade. Frank. Running out of the bedroom, before my eyes was the chaotic scene of the living room. Underwear was scattered all over the floor, but it was all torn. Returning to the bedroom, I now noticed that the wardrobe had been ransacked and my underwear was gone. Neatly placed inside is a set of red underwear and a piece of paper. You will look great wearing it. I panicked, crumpled the piece of paper and took the clothes straight to the trash can in the kitchen and threw it in. I tied the trash bag tightly. In the cutlery drawer, a string appeared. I grabbed it and pulled hard. The drawer slowly opened, revealing an old, worn out doll wearing a white dress, her body tied tightly with a rope. The doll has a pretty smile, but has two black tear lines drawn on its face. Trembling, I picked up the doll and saw its dress was stained red in a sensitive position. I was extremely panicked. I took scissors and cut the doll to pieces, trying to put it in a trash bag with the underwear. But its eyes were staring at me. His eyes were innocent but filled with pain and resentment. I quickly ran towards the door. I didn't want these disgusting things to exist in the house. Running to the door, my heart was once again squeezed. The picture I took with my best friend was posted on the door. We hugged each other tightly, cheek to cheek. But my friend's face was pasted over with another man's smile. A person I hate and loathe, Frank. I fell to the floor. My head hurt. I hugged my chest and sobbed. More than 20 years ago, my mother remarried a man named Roger. My stepfather is very kind and warm, but his stepson ruined my childhood. He is Frank a cruel pervert hiding under the appearance of a handsome and kind man. He bullied me when I was young, leaving me with long scars. When I was a high school student, he began to pay attention and confessed his love to me many times. I tried every way to avoid him and denounce him to my mother, but Frank always has the perfect excuse to cover things up. 
One time when my mother and stepfather were away, he lured me into the warehouse, tied me up with a rope and gagged me. He deserves to be damned for what he did to me. That disgusting pervert was sentenced to 15 years in prison. For the past 15 years, I have had a new peaceful life. I seem to have forgotten that haunting face and smile. He's back again. Why did he find my place? Is he planning on ruining my life again? The deep voice accompanied by a chilling laughter <laughs> echoed right next to my ear, pushing me into the depths of utter terror. Nice to see you again, dear sister. I have smelled this perfume somewhere. I'm Jonathan, 31 years old. I work as a long haul bus driver. Currently, I live with my wife in the town of Galena. That evening, I received a late night passenger ride to the town, about a three hour drive from my home. After safely dropping off the passengers at 11 p.m., I immediately headed back home. As usual, I would find the nearest motel to spend the night before returning home in the morning. But that day was very important because my wife was about to give birth and was waiting for me in the hospital. We were expecting our first child, a cute little boy, and just the thought of it made me very excited. I searched on Google Maps for the shortest route home. Following Google Maps directions for about an hour, I turned right off the highway onto a narrow dirt road. At that moment, I was only thinking about my wife and child, not noticing the ominous darkness enveloping the road in my car. After driving a bit further, suddenly the radio in my car started making static noises. I tried to turn off the knob but couldn't, and adjusting the radio frequency didn't stop the annoying static noise. Feeling helpless, I lightly tapped the radio and thought there might be a problem with it. Suddenly, a woman's voice came from the radio. Please be advised, ahead you will encounter a landslide on the road. Absolutely do not talk or make eye contact with the people there unless you want to endanger your life. I was extremely surprised, but then thought it might be some program airing on the radio. After driving a bit more, the road ahead indeed had a landslide and there was a warning sign. I looked around in astonishment and two rescue workers emerged from the darkness. I couldn't see their faces clearly, only their silhouettes. One was very overweight and the other was thin. They slowly approached the BMW parked in front of my car. The owner of the BMW stepped out and politely greeted them. Suddenly, the thin rescue worker rushed forward and grabbed the BMW owner. They both fell in front of the BMW so I couldn't see what was happening. I was quite panicked at that moment, wondering if I should run over to assess the situation or not. The horrifying began to unfold. The overweight rescue worker was staring directly at my car, but it wasn't a normal look. He turned his head 180 degrees, his face and back facing towards me. He was smiling, a wide, ear-to-ear -ear grin. He maintained that posture and walked towards my car. I was extremely frightened, quickly shifted into reverse and pressed on the gas to back up. But my car didn't budge. I became even more frantic. That rescue worker had now walked right next to the driver's side window of my car. I remembered the instructions from the woman on the radio, not to talk or make eye contact with the people there. I trembled, trying to keep my gaze straight ahead. The rescue worker leaned down to look into my car, still wearing that eerie <laughs> smile. He repeatedly pounded on my car window, not with his hands, but with his head. My heart was pounding at full force, and I closed my eyes, gripping the steering wheel tightly. The pounding grew louder and more intense. The only thing in my head at that moment was my wife and the soon-to-be-born child. I don't know how long after the pounding stopped, I took a deep breath and slowly opened my eyes. The overweight rescue worker was still staring into my car and smiling. In front of me was the thin rescue worker, his body covered in blood. I didn't know what he had done to the BMW owner. My car was now started. I immediately reversed and sped away at 62 miles per hour. After driving a fair distance, I calmed down. I suddenly remembered I had to call the police. I tried to describe in detail everything I had just experienced. The police told me to stay calm and send them my location. After identifying my location, the police asked me to stay put so they could find me as quickly as possible. I agreed, but as soon as I hung up the phone, 
I remembered my wife in the hospital. Without much thought, I immediately pressed on the gas and sped away. When I saw the turnoff leading to the highway, I was relieved. But as soon as I turned the steering wheel to enter, in front of me was the dirt road with the landslide and those two rescue workers. What on earth is happening? I immediately turned the car around and sped off, not wanting to encounter those two terrifying figures again. But everything seemed to be mocking me. Once again, I returned to that road. The two rescue workers looked at me, still with that wide grin, but this time the laughter was very loud and echoed in the dark. It was as if those two lunatics were mocking me. At that moment, I didn't slow down but pressed the gas pedal even harder. I didn't know why I acted like that. The car sped up, aiming straight at those two rescue workers. In front of me, everything was pitch black. I couldn't comprehend what had happened next. Suddenly, the eerie faces of the two rescue workers appeared. Their large, wild eyes, wide grinning mouths with sharp, jagged teeth dripping with blood. They were getting closer and closer to me, the mouth gaping wide as if to swallow everything. They emitted the cry of a newborn baby. It pierced my ears painfully. I woke up. In front of me was the hospital scene, my wife holding our son sitting on a wheelchair next to my bed. I woke up completely sober when I realized the crying of my son. My wife burst into tears when she saw me awake. She said the police found me sitting in the car in an unconscious state. I asked my wife where I was found. She said it was on the dirt road with the landslide. But there was no BMW or rescue workers there. The police concluded that my accident was due to night driving leading to stress and drowsiness. I recounted to the police and my wife what I had experienced but they all thought it was just a nightmare. After, the accident left me with repercussions. I often suffered from headaches, so I couldn't drive anymore. My car, after being repaired for a week at the garage, was brought back home. Strangely, the dirt on the driver's side window couldn't be cleaned. I realized with a start that it was the mark when the overweight rescue worker used his head to pound on it. Until now, I still couldn't explain everything that happened that night. I'm Lisa, living alone in a comfortable apartment in Seattle, Washington, USA. When we got down to the parking lot, the air was cold and gloomy, with only a few cars parked overnight. One week, I signed up to work overtime at the company until late at night. I remember it was Tuesday. I lazily left the office at nearly 10 p.m., when we got down to the parking garage, the air was cold and gloomy, with only a few cars parked overnight. I approached my parking spot, panicked when I saw the car had a black skull painted on it. I went home, frustration lingering within me all night. The next morning, I asked the security guard to review the security camera in the parking garage. I want to know the bastard who did the trick. But the camera quality was very low. Only seeing a black shadow, I parked the car in quite a dark location. I had to swallow my anger and let him go. That evening, I still got off work late like the day before. Learning from experience, this time I parked the car near the camera. I carefully went around to check, seeing that the car was still intact. I felt secure in opening the door and sitting in. Suddenly, there were clicking sounds followed by savage laughter. It echoed in the quiet night space of the car tunnel. Startled, I grabbed the steering wheel tightly. A few seconds later, the laughter stopped, and I took a moment to calm down. Even though I'm a woman, I'm a rather brave one, and I don't believe in ghost stories. Slowly opening the door and getting out of the car, I looked around. The clicking sound rang out again. I concentrated on listening, slowly sat down and looked under the car. What caught my eye was that wrinkled face, that creepy smile, and that savage laugh. I pulled out a devil toy. It was probably made on Halloween. <gasps> Who the hell is doing this? I muttered angrily. I walked around the parking area but couldn't find the vandal. That silly thing took me a lot of time. It was already 12 o'clock when I got home. The next morning, I went to work late feeling tired and lethargic. My close colleague, Evelyn, asked me worriedly, Are you okay, Lisa? Don't work too hard. 
Receiving a cup of coffee from Evelyn makes me feel more comfortable. Talking a little about Evelyn, she is Asian American. I love her beauty. Don't tell me you're still working overtime tonight, right? Evelyn asked. I smiled and nodded. She looked surprised and helpless, then left to go back to work. By 8 p.m. that night, I was exhausted. My mind couldn't work anymore. I decided to go home and rest early. Going down to the basement, heading towards the parking lot, I heard someone mumbling. The closer I got to where I parked, the clearer the whisper became. I could hear the content of what that person said were scary curses. Walking faster, my heart pounded when I realized there was a figure standing next to my car. I ran over, but that person noticed and immediately ran away. He ran so fast I couldn't keep up and lost track of him. Returning to the parking lot, I was startled to discover a strange object. It was a small piece of yellow paper. Drawn on it were very strange characters. I guess they were charms. I've heard of witchcraft, but it's not really popular in America. I was so shocked. I couldn't believe I would fall into this terrible situation. On the drive home, I kept thinking about the talisman. I asked myself a lot of questions about myself and my relationships. That night was truly terrifying for me. I was half awake and half dreaming, always feeling like someone was lying next to me. A cold hand was placed on my arm. I was fully aware and felt but unable to react. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. That cold hand gradually touched my neck and squeezed hard. I widened my eyes in fear, my body still stiff even though I tried to struggle. The hand squeezed even tighter. My neck hurt. I sat up, opened my mouth wide and inhaled as much as I could. I'm using two hands, squeezing my neck tightly. I fell into a daze and sat like that all night. It wasn't until the next afternoon that I arrived at the company. I wore a silk scarf to cover the bruises on my neck. Looking around, I couldn't see Evelyn. I asked my colleagues. They said she had a serious car accident last night. The garage guard said that she panicked and ran away quickly out of the parking garage, and at that moment, a car came. During that afternoon, I thought a lot about Evelyn. Now that I'm married, my husband is the one who helped me get through that difficult period. I am working as a department head and continuously succeed with large projects. As for Evelyn, she has been in a vegetative state for the past five years. I still keep the video recorded by the hidden camera I placed in the car. The images of Evelyn with an evil look in her eyes that I had never seen before. <laughs>